to let folks in um, as they join the waiting room here. Um, but since it's a little after six um, and this conversation I'm sure will be full, uh, I think I suggest we go ahead and get started. So my name is Michelle Gates. I'm with the Vermont Garden Network. I've been with the organization for going on four seasons now. Um, joined in January of 2018, right before the gardening season. And um, we've, our organization has grown pretty significantly over the last couple of years. Um, we've been a statewide organization for some time, but we are um, implementing new programming. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot more with affordable housing throughout the state. And then we are going to be launching a new mobile classroom this year. Um, and with all of that, continues to um, arrive in our inboxes questions about how we are supposed to be coping with uh, all these changes that are going on in our world. And so um, this discussion is kind of a culmination of our programs committee getting together and really thinking about how do we talk um, with gardeners. So we know that a lot of farmers are already focusing on some of these changes and adaptations, um, but we know that there are thousands of gardeners across the state um, who not only would appreciate having information about what to expect or, or you know, um, solutions and strategies, but also can be part of the solution. And so we wanna make sure that everyone is involved in this conversation. So that was sort of the impetus for getting these, this um, panel discussion together. We are meeting today for the, for the third and um, final installment of this particular pilot series and we don't know what the next steps are going to be um, but from all indications of comments that have trickled in from the last couple of conversations um, this can't be the end of the conversation so we will be we will be sharing what we come up with um, after that um, at this time I want to introduce Joseph Kiefer who is the vice president of our board who is no stranger to gardening and climate change um, has been in that work and food systems work for um, a couple of years. Um, and has been instrumental um, with Fred and a couple of Fred Schmidt and a couple of others in getting this panel together and going. So I appreciate um, both of you and uh, kicking me in the butt and making sure this happens. Um, so I will uh, let Joseph take it over from here and introduce our panelists and I will keep letting folks in. Great, thank you, Michelle. And thank you to uh, Leslie Ann and Alan for joining us tonight. It's really wonderful that you could be here. And uh, <clears throat> maybe just to say a couple of words, this is my fourth year on the board. And I wanna just highlight, if you don't know much about the Vermont Garden Network, uh, prior called the Vermont Community Garden Network, uh, but now much more inclusive for home gardens and school gardens and housing sites and every place where you can grow food, uh, I wanna just sing the praises of the My Garden Network with a, a small staff, they do tremendous work. A couple of just programs that jump out, uh, Gardening for Health with the, with the UVM Medical Center, a, a focus on food as medicine, a pizza garden at Ethan Allen Homestead where folks can spend week after week with a hands-on course. Uh, Summer Gardens for Learning, which is a program for for uh, children at risk of hunger, teaching about gardening, cooking, and nutrition. And uh, like Michelle just said, now we have a van that's going to be coming around the state delivering programs and uh, gardening materials to help people grow food. Um, I kind of want to just tune into the moment that we're living through and uh, maybe a moment of silence for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are fighting for their freedom, fighting for democracy, justice. Uh, I guess we're seeing, you know, another example of oil being used for war and, and uh, in a terrible, inhumane way. So uh, just a moment, please. Thank you. Um, We've had, this is the third, and I was gonna highlight all three, but I think you can just turn back and, and view these sessions. But our first session dealt with food security and uh, everyone from, from Sam Bliss, uh, a UVM doctoral student at the Gund Institute, Meg First, a South Royalton Community 
community gardener who spoke about localizing our food system and climate friendly gardening. Uh, Karen Ganey, who's working with kids on the Change the World Kids Youth Run, Youth Run Project. She does a lot with uh, food recovery and soup kit, pro soup kit project. And uh, David Zuckerman, that most people know, but he was speaking about as being one of the larger food growers in Chittenden County. And he took a look at all the food he has in stock in November. And he figured that if he had to share that food with everybody in Chittenden County, it could get about, um, about a pound of food for one person per day. That's how much food and how secure we are with how much food we're growing in Chittenden County to feed the citizens. So we have questions around food security for sure. And our second session, Ann Hazelrig uh, spoke about pests and diseases and climate change. 71% uh, increase in, in temperature in New England. And she talked, you know, with more rain, more fungal disease, more bacterial disease. And uh, she talked about, you know, how to, how to deal with drought because we both have extreme intense rain and then intense drought, mulching, covering the, earth, covering the soil. Uh, and then we had Kat Buxton and she spoke beautifully about soil and soil health and the principles of soil and building soil and feeding the soil. So tonight, we're really lucky to have two incredible speakers with us. And I just moved everything. Uh, Dr. Leslie Ann dupigny Giraud. I hope I get that right. Uh, she's our state climatologist. So that's a wonderful thing. And she's a professor at UVM, geology and geosciences. She just told us earlier, she has a class with 120 students right now at UVM. So I think there's a lot of people interested in climate, weather, uh, geography. And, uh, and then Dr. Alan Betts, who I must say, I read on a regular basis in our Sunday Times Argus. So it's nice to see your face, uh, Alan Betts. <laughs> so we're gonna start uh, with Leslie Ann for the next 20 minutes. And I have just for everyone knows, this little sign to say we have two minutes left. Because <laughs> our first time we did this, we didn't, every, people just naturally went over. So that's just a little tip off. So thank you very much. Well, thank you to um, Joseph for that wonderful introduction and to Michelle for the uh, invitation to be here in this space. It is wonderful to see some familiar faces. Fred, I'm going to give you a shout out because it's been way too long since we connected. So nice to see you um, and thank you for helping to help me to get into this space. So I am going to try sharing my screen here. Um, Michelle, if, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, perfect. So let's see, I'm going to do my whole screen here because I want to actually share some other stuff at the very, very end. Okay. All right, so I'm going to give um, a relatively broad overview. I think it, it's great to be coming at the end, having heard that um, soil health and drought and all those pieces were covered in, in the previous sessions. And so I'm gonna take us a little bit back out and zoom back in, and then Alan's gonna take it over from there. I understand he has a, a surprise for us. So I'm looking forward to the pieces of what Alan's gonna be looking at. So here's a, a, a quick shot just to get us in, in, in the frame of um, some Norway maples here at UVM, which are experiencing drought conditions. And we can see a lot of the um, leaves, the leaf curl and the scorching that takes place as the, um, the, 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 the plants try to conserve a lot of the moisture loss um, in terms of having less um, transpiration surface for it to occur. And so what I'm going to, to, to spend some time talking about are some of these various elements of our changing climate. Um, particularly with respect to Vermont, and then um, look at some of the, the implications that we might um, be uh, concerned with. So 
thinking about climate, thinking about climate change, one of the things that I always like to, to make sure that we are looking at it from a, a systems perspective. So looking at not just temperature, not just rainfall, but also things like winds. I think there was a question that came in about um, really strong winds and what does that mean for, for us as, as gardeners, thinking of, about soil health and soil moisture, but also things like humidity of the atmosphere and clouds and all of the things that we need to have as an entire system perspective and how all of those various elements are actually changing. So I think for, for, for us as, as gardeners, a lot of when we think about climate change, we kind of probably hone in on this last part of this diagram that shows you ways in which we can understand and talk about climate change. And it, it looks at, at increase in variations over time. So things like more heat waves and cold waves, more floods and droughts. And then what does that mean for us in, in our ability to be flexible as, as gardeners, as agriculturalists in the face of changing moisture patterns, changing temperature patterns, changing wind patterns. And so that increase in variability, which is what we're seeing down in here is, is one element that I wanted to sort of highlight. And the, the red lines that I've drawn on there are the bounds within which I think we really, really thrive as societies, as um, whatever activity we're doing is when we get outside of those bounds that the, um, the, the chaos starts. So in, in looking at this and in looking at some of the, the elements of what we're going to be talking about here, um, we're, we're looking at not just moisture extremes, but also the type of moisture that we're looking at. So did we get the snow that we needed? Did it stay for the entire length of the season? How fast did it go? What are some of the, the characteristics of um, the entire state, whether it's it's our mountain and valleys, whether it's the type of soils that we are, are growing our, our vegetables and, and flowers on. Um, what's the microclimate that we have where we live and how different that is as we go from town to town and what does that mean for us? And then when you think about things like um, stress on our plants, it's not just moisture stress, but it's also high temperatures, low temperatures, and what do those mean for us? And I think Alan might get into looking at some of the elements of um, change in plant hardiness and how those have um, varied over time. And as we think about it, um, all of these impacts are going to change by the either the, the crop or the species that we're talking about. And it's not static either. So I remember when I moved to Vermont 25 years ago and starting to learn about the, the climate and the weather around the state. And I remember somebody said to me, oh, we might be growing rice soon if it gets wetter, right? And then in the last couple of years, people have actually been saying to me, oh, can you tell me how things are changing in the islands? Because that's a great place for doing viticulture. And there's some amazing wines that are being produced across the state because we're sort of learning to adapt and be flexible as our climate changes and, and, and new types of crops, new types of species are becoming more and more viable. So a lot of what we, we do here in the state is driven by our topography, our landscape, our mountains. So our green mountains here, of course, part of the Appalachians, and that sets up certain types of wind conditions. So down sloping winds, we'll, we'll come back and talk about winds in a sec, but it also sets up um, the, 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 the dis distinction between who gets some types of precipitation and who doesn't. So this little shot on the, the lower left here is um, from an ice storm from a few years ago where we had icing on one side of, of the greens and then rain on the other side because of that very, very sharp distinction from an orographic, from a topographic perspective. So let's talk a little bit about moisture. And we, when we talk about moisture, most of the time we think about excessive moisture, like too much moisture. So I thought we would start in the opposite direction, talk about too little moisture. So looking at it from a, a drought perspective. And I was, I was giving an interview earlier today um, with a person who lives in, in Barton in Northeast Kingdom, and we were talking about droughts. And um, she actually had gone to this, this, this website, drought.gov, and pulled up the, the patterns across Caledonia County from you know, 1895 all the way to, to present. And one of the things that's, that's um, interesting about the state is that earlier in the record, earlier in the 1900s, we tended to be relatively drought prone. And that's what you're seeing here with these orange and brown 
lines. And then about 1970s, we actually switched to becoming more moisture prone. But that does not mean that we don't have droughts anymore. So we're still in a drought. We're still in a hydrologic drought that's actually been in place since about 2020 um, to present. So it's it's understanding and knowing about some of these patterns and dynamics that help us to, to learn to be a little bit more flexible in terms of our um, adaptability. So when we think about how does drought affect us from a, 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 a sort of vegetation perspective, um, if you've ever been to Sam Maza's um, stand here in, in Chittenden County, um, I was fortunate to be out there um, a couple of years back when there was a drought and this is what the field looked like. And it was so bone dry, you literally just had to walk and all of the dust got kicked up because there's no moisture in the soil itself. So when you think about soil moisture and how that's important, it's one of the pieces that we know um, plays a really big part in looking at drought. Now, the other part about drought is Vermont is known for having droughts and, and floods taking place in the same year. And so when we're looking at this and we're thinking about um, being flexible, sometimes we have these um, con concurrent coincident stressors going on. So it could be moisture, it could be um, in insect infestation, it could be all of these various pieces. And sometimes we can even see the effects of too much moisture at the same time as too little. So you've got the leaf scorch and leaf curl that you see in here. And at the same time, I kid you not, this was like three plants over where the Norway maples were still having that tar spot because the previous year had been so wet. And so you can see all of these various um, elements taking place literally at the same time, depending on your species. And that's why I said a lot of these could be species dependent. So the other part about drought is that it sets up just the right conditions for having wildfires. And I know wildfires are not something that we always think about or talk about in the state, but if the drought has continued from one year into the next, so we're into fire season right now, if the atmosphere is dry enough, and if the fuels on the ground are dry enough, then we can really have a, a really severe fire season, which in, in, in the state of Vermont tends to be primarily in the spring and then also into the summer itself. So droughts, um, dry conditions, um, having those type of stresses are important. On the flip side, we have too much moisture. And so um, Tropical Storm Irene was a, a great example of looking at what happens from a vegetative perspective when you have too much moisture present in the landscape and then just the slightest disturbance allowed all of these um, trees to actually sort of fall over because the ground was so saturated. So it's the complete opposite of what we have in our uh, moisture conditions um, in that particular case there. So, Moisture is one element of looking at how our climate is changing. Winds are another piece that we can talk about here. And so when we, we think about winds, we can look at it from a very localized perspective. So winds that come straight on down, hit the ground and then produce a lot of damage um, locally. Or we can think about it in terms of, of the wind speeds that are in question. So when, when we get up to wind speeds that are over 55 and up to like 70s, we're actually getting into a hurricane type of winds. And we don't always have that here, but when it occurs, it produces this tremendous amount of damage. Again, something for us to kind of think about because um, the entire climate system moves beyond just temperature and humidity. So one of the questions that came in was about how do you protect against winds or what are you gonna do about winds? And so um, I pulled a couple of slides from the ones that I talk about in my class in how do you protect against winds? And one way is to, to, to create shelter belts because what that does is if you put obstructions in the wind flow, it slows down the wind. And so, you can do it by planting trees, which would take a while to you know, grow, develop, get to maturity. Or if you want to do a, do a living type of fence, you could probably put um, different types of um, wooden structures. Again, the idea is to, to slow that down so you don't have as much soil erosion taking place. Um, you improve the habitat, you improve some of the aesthetics of, of the, the region that you happen to be living in. So just a quick little animation that shows you what happens whenever the air goes over one of these um, 
shelter belts or obstructions. It sort of slows it down. And then whatever is right behind that feature actually gets protected a little bit. So part of it is design, part of it is the height, part of it is how do you construct that to, to break up that wind flow. So in terms of, of temperature, when we're, we're, we're looking at this and we're looking at um, how do extreme temperatures um, play out for um, producing stress on our vegetation? Well, we can think about it from a, an extreme high temperature or an extreme low temperature. And when we're looking at it from extreme high temperature and those are those heat waves, um, how do those then combine with, with moisture stress to, to produce significant decreases in either yields or in the health of our, our vegetation? When we think about it from a, an extreme cold perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things that we were looking at here is Sometimes in the winter time, we get particularly cold temperatures, but then it warms up a little bit and then it goes back cold. And that is not great because your, your trees start to um, photosynthesize and then they're, they're frozen. Then you see a lot of that brown um, damage in, in the summertime because of those extremes that you saw in the winter. So thermal stress is one thing that we can look at and how that's changing over time. Now, the other part about changing temperatures is um, sometimes it's like, oh, great, temperatures are going up. That means our, our growing season is going to be longer. True. But if the growing season is longer, some of the other questions that we need to keep in mind are, do we have enough moisture to actually take advantage of those longer growing seasons? Plus, if you have a longer growing season, that means you also have a longer time for forest fires to develop for plant infestations, pest infestations to occur, for summer droughts to exacerbate and worsen. So um, it's not just a one-to-one. -one. And so what are some of these other um, coincident factors that we need to keep in mind with our longer growing season? And so um, Environment Canada, Agriculture Canada has this wonderful diagram that you see here that kind of breaks apart some of the potential positive impacts of um, our changing climate in, in, in terms of productivity, the ability to have new crops like, like the, the viticulture here in the state of Vermont, the longer growing seasons, but then some of the negative impacts such as your increased soil erosion, um, damage because of, of high temperatures in the changes in herbicide use and, and so forth. So all of these we need to kind of keep in mind in terms of pros and cons, um, pluses and, and, and minuses in, in this element here. And the, the gas that we um, see that has a potential to increase with increasing temperatures is ozone at the lower levels, at the levels at which we walk around. And ozone is important because it um, is a, an irritant for us as human beings. It's also an irritant for plants. And so if there's more ozone at our ground levels, it, it increases susceptibility to things like um, insect disease and, and so forth. And there's certain species that are particularly susceptible to, to ground level ozone. And by the way, ground level ozone is also a greenhouse gas. So a couple of reasons why we need to, to, to sort of keep a finger on the, the ongoing monitoring of how much ozone we have at lower levels where we actually happen to be. So we were talking at the beginning um, about all the snow that we, we got over the last um, couple of days and who still has snow and whose snow is melted. So one thing that that snow in April, so yesterday was the 19th of April, today's the 20th of April. One thing that that points to is, is these variability that we see in our climate. And when we have things like snowfall in April or in June, when we have frosts that actually kill plants in the summer, when we have um, these thaw and freeze cycles in the winter, those are all part of what's called a backward spring. So we've been seeing a number of these recently, and it's one of the, the, the elements or the indicators of climate variability and change. And I'm more than happy to, to send the entire reference to this if you wanna read a little bit more about these, these backward seasons. And if anybody has some wicked cool pictures that they'd love to share, I'm also happy to receive those. So I can swap these out. These have been here for the last 12 years. Okay, so in, in terms of, of some of these other temperature thermal stressors, um, frost is one big piece. And, and I don't know about you, but I remember when I first came to Vermont, one thing that I read or learned is that you don't plant before Memorial Day 
right? And there's a reason for that. And part of it, Alan's smiling here, part of it is, is because we still have the potential for frost occurring. And I remember I tried planting um, some wildflower seeds uh, before Memorial Day. I learned my lesson because I got weeds. I didn't get not one flower. So there is some truth to this. And on a more serious note, um, there are a couple species, a couple of plants that are particularly susceptible to springtime frost. One are apple, apples, right? And so you've got um, an example here of what it looks like in, in October when it's harvested after it had been hit by frost earlier that year. And then Christmas tree growers are also susceptible to having um, frost conditions um, affect their, their crops. So heading into the home stretch here, um, I am the, the, the house appointed representative to the uh, Vermont Climate Council, bringing climate change expertise to the council. And I sit on the science and data subcommittee. Um, I want to lift up the work, the incredible work that was done on the agriculture and ecosystems subcommittee in this space. And some of the, the, the strategies that came out of many, 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 many months and, and discussions of things that uh, we could be doing to adapt to climate change, to mitigate against climate change, because agriculture has this wonderful um, opportunity to be both um, uh, a mitigate, mitigation strategy against climate change, but also a wonderful exemplar of adapting to, to climate change. And so I'm lifting this up here to move into the, the, the ways of thinking about sustainable um, development, sustainable growth, sustainable food systems, and hopefully looping it back to a lot of the food security um, conversations that went on in the very first session of, of this um, Vermont um, Garden Network programming. And so, um, some of the, the values um, that were lifted up as part of that um, agriculture and ecosystem subcommittee in terms of, of local foods, in terms of both working lands and natural lands, a uh, cultural hum humility, um, conservation of, of all resources, conservation of our land. I just, again, wanted to lift up some of the, the elements of, of their work. And a lot of their work was, was really and truly informed by the, the scholarship of, of Judy Dow, who is an Abenaki elder and scholar, and who shared, created this diagram and shared with us as, as council members at the very beginning of our entire process. And um, my great privilege to, to lift up Judy's work here um, in, in terms of helping us to understand um, all of the, the practices and knowledges of, of our Abenaki um, scholars and elders and peoples um, across the state of Vermont. And these knowledges, indigenous knowledges, traditional knowledges are one of the, the, the elements that I, I'm learning more and more about um, in, in, in how to walk gently on the earth, how to be more sustainable in, in my own life and in my practices. And so um, very grateful to be able to, to lift up, honor and, and cherish and celebrate all of the IK and TK that I can learn from. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Alan, because I know you might be getting into some of these elements as well, and hopefully I've set you up well to, to take it over. Thank you, Leslie Ann and Alan, take it over. Take it over. Let me just, can you pick up this uh, talk Is it, and put it on your screen? Um, I made you a co-host, so you ought to be able to just share your screen. Oh, where's the button for that? <laughs> um, if you put your cursor down at the bottom of the screen, it should you should see a green um, little button that says share screen. Oh, okay. Um, go back to the meeting, share screen, very good. And share, okay. And- There you go. All right, good, 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 good. Oh, all right. Uh, well, thank you, Leslie Ann. That's a very nice overview of so many things that I can, well, the, the, one of the challenges of this topic is it is so, so vast. And Leslie Ann has gone through a huge bunch of issues and I'm going to go through a, a radically different set of issues and <laughs> You, as the audience, have to somehow put all the, some of these pieces together. And I'm going to talk about the climate 
crisis perspective and talk about two aspects of it. How can society deal with it? And how can we as individuals deal with it? And how can we as gardeners deal with it? And I've got some papers at the end here that you can pick up that I've given to your um, organizers. And this is my schematic uh, of the, the climate of the earth. And this is a new satellite picture around January the 4th. And that's me gardening on that same date. I cut the dates on the screen, but it's gone on my thing here. The greenhouse gases are critical because they keep the earth warm. But as CO2 and methane goes up, it's storing, being stored in the oceans and more water evaporates and water vapor triples the warming from the other greenhouse gases. And the other thing that happens to the climate system is that snow and ice melt and they reflect sunlight so they keep the earth cool. And the poles as the ice melts there are warming much faster than the earth as a whole and our winters are warming if we have less snow. The oceans are storing the heat and the general problem is the extremes are increasing as the Arctic warms and the westerlies slow down. But for me, my, I'm a gardener. I've been in Vermont for about 45 years and gardened all that time. And the real wake up call for me was when I found myself gardening in January. No, not that long ago, 15 years ago. Um, I always hung up my spade <laughs> in November. The idea that I could be gardening in January hadn't really occurred to me until I found the ground wasn't frozen. 2007, eight years, 2012. 2012, my garden was only frozen for 67 days. That was staggered me. And here's my granddaughter gardening in February for the very first time. And she simply didn't understand it when I said to her, you're the first kid to be gardening here since the last interglacial 100,000 years ago. She thought I was, you know, nutty grandfather. But here, 2020, here I've got three granddaughters here in January, me in February, and I was able to dig again in March. 2020 was the peak so far of, from a gardening perspective in Pittsford, being able to do this. But just so that someone commented, I finished gardening, tilling over my cover crop this year, yesterday and the snow had already gone. We had only about an inch of snow and it all melted. And I finished digging this over yesterday. And just to show you how I garden through the winter, uh, because I can't wait till Memorial Day, is under, I have these panes of glass, which are actually um, thick glass windows. And I've made frames for them and I have spinach. And these are some lettuce that are heading up. It wasn't a great winter. I mean, these get covered over with snow. It was a pretty chilly one, but I've got some lettuce heading up. Some years I've got head lettuce to eat at this time. We have one other big reference for change in Vermont. We could keep track of some of our lakes when they freeze up. This is Stiles Pond where the record goes back to 1970. This is the freeze up date and this is the ice out date. And the, this is the time that it is frozen. And you can see a general downward trend. This is a line been fitted, but you can also see staggering increases in the variability from year to year. Staggering increases. Now the variability from year to year is as big as the variability over the 40 years, 40, 50 years. This is a big issue if you're a gardener because you have to in some sense keep track of much increasing variability. And Leslie Ann showed uh, Irene, and I just wanted to show you, step back and show you the big picture of the 2011 floods that we have. This is the ranking of precipitation. We in Vermont had a big spring flood and a big spring flood in the August from Irene. This is the March to August ranking of precipitation across the United States. And the ones here mean that Texas and New Mexico were the driest on record. And the 117s from Ohio to Vermont meant that we, this Northeast had the wettest in the 117 years of record. Stationary pattern across the US for a long period in that six month period there, storms going across the North. Now, I'm going, this is my talk if I've got time, 
is in two parts. The first is I'm going to talk a little bit about climate science, science policy, that is society and science and climate. Basically, and I'm going to be very blunt here, and many of you who read my columns will have already seen some of this stuff. Policy for climate science is dictated in the US by the rich and powerful, and we've reached a crisis point. And what we have largely ignored, and I'm glad Leslie Ann raised it, is the indigenous worldview. Because essentially the shift that we have to make is to the indigenous worldview. But what we actually have is what I call the fossil empire dictating policy, all the corporations with fossil fuel interests and webs and webs of lies to confuse the public by politicians. And that's been going on for 40 years. But the deeper issue here is that climate change is a reflection of the misuse of human power. And that's a huge issue that affects both science and policy and goes back a very long time to the Council of Nicaea. And I've included a slide here, I'm sure I'm gonna to have to skip over it. When we actually destroyed the indigenous worldview to meet the needs of the Roman emperor, and it continued through the rise of Western science for more than a thousand years. Now, the issue that bugged me when I started doing science 50 years ago was that I was told that science and policy had to be kept separate. Separation was the traditional flame. It's how we train our scientists. It helps protect the integrity. It's good for global co cooperation. But we can't solve global changes with this type of separation that goes back 1700 years, basically, and drove also the rise of science. So I realized long ago, wasn't enough. We had to merge science with wisdom. So I went looking and I'll come back to that. And here's an example of, it's called the Blue River Declaration um, because it was on the Oregon's Blue River, 2011. A truly adaptive civilization will, will align its ethics with the ways of the earth. A civilization that ignores the deep constraints of its world will find itself in exactly the situation we face now on the threshold of making the planet inhospitable to humankind and other species. This is a statement of the indigenous worldview, but ours is different. Our statement as a society, not saying you as gardeners, is that we're in charge, we can exploit the earth and people for make lots of money. The reality is, is doomed to fail, it is failing, because the earth is far more powerful than us. And I'll come around to that. This is the indigenous mindset discussion, and I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over it, you can read it later. Christianity lost that heresy when Emperor Constantine decided to dictate, take over Christianity and said, we'll stop persecuting you if you destroy the Aramaic gospels. Yeshua was an indigenous Aramaic teacher and his thinking was not based on human power at all. But the destruction of the Aramaic gospels and the, the killing of course of earlier of that heretic uh, that we know as Jesus established the human power over nature that's gone on. It killed the Aramaic Christians and on and on. And I'm not gonna go into that detail. But science arose with tremendous success within that framework in, say, 15, 1600s, without moral standards and wisdom. And we were, Europeans went around the world, exploited, killed off the indigenous people, enslaved people, and on and on and on. And when capitalism arose, it rose within this framework with no moral standards. And the US controlled the global oil supply for 70 years, and that fueled what we were, I'm going to call cheerfully, fossil capitalism. <laughs> Big, big issue. I haven't gone for 10 minutes yet, good. The oil, for oil companies, and I'm personifying ExxonMobil because they're senior scientists 40 years ago, basically successfully accurately modeled what doubling CO2 would do to our climate and told management that they only had five or 10 years to change direction. He was silenced and a web of lies was started that, and they bribe US politicians, it's extraordinarily cheap to, to bribe Republicans to deny climate change. But basically what we have is global ecocide, that's destruction of life on this planet to make the profits of the fossil empire keep them flowing. So review of the first section, burning fossil fuels is changing the climate. There are many water cycle processes and ice processes that amplify. Climate extremes are increasing. 
stationary patterns in particular and rapid changes, floods, droughts, these kinds of issues that uh, Leslie Ann discussed. We've avoided responsibility as a society with various types of cover-ups. And the basic problem is no one will discuss that a stable climate is simply incompatible with business as usual and incompatible with the fossil empire dictating rules and bribing politicians. Uh -uh. <sighs> it's a misuse of human power issue and we can fix it just by changing the system guidelines and that's a moral choice we can create an efficient society and base it on renewable energy but that's a value-based moral issue which we as a society have not i'm having a problem with my button we have to shift for the indigenous worldview and we have to value the future of life on earth i bugged i wrote an article for a science journal back in 76 because i didn't like the fact that science was scientists were told to do what society says and i contrasted being elite our elite whether our allegiances were to the planet earth or just to a research contract and typically this is what we are told to do as researchers and funded to do no one's responsible to the earth and i realized 45 years ago the disaster lay ahead so I went looking. So in parallel to a research career, I also went looking around the world. And I'm just going to give you one side glimpse and skip over all of this. I asked in 1980, how can science be merged with wisdom? And someone who was wise said, go and ask Yogi Ramsarat Kumar in Tiruvannamali, which is in India. He would know. Now, <laughs> that's a stunning statement in itself. And I did go and see him and I, it's in the paper I cited. But even before I got there, I slipped into a meditation room of another saint and slipped down. I was so, so relieved. I've arrived in this town of Tiruvannamali, Ava crossing India. And by the way, I was on my way to a science meeting with Russians in Kiev of all places. I was picked up within minutes. I was connected to everything that is, the earth, the creation, and basically for an hour taken through my life and shown all my interconnections with the web of life. It was an absolutely stunning experience and I, I came out ecstatic. I had no concept that as a scientist, a place could be so sacred, all I had to do was sit down and surrender and I could be connected to everything. And I sat with living saints and learned from indigenous teacher here in, in Vermont and on and on. I didn't learn about uh, what Yeshua or Jesus actually taught as an indigenous teacher until about five years ago, the book. So I want you to try and slip now for the rest of this short talk into an earth system framework and realize this is heresy. If I say earth system or fossil empire, it's easy for us to choose. Obviously you'll choose the earth system, but you're not understanding what you really are doing and can doing. The earth system is actually in charge. That is the indigenous frame. It's actually watching you when you garden. Now that is a staggering thought and it can feed you information to deal with the complexity of climate change as that's going on. So as a climate scientist, let's just skip through a few climate disasters from the earth system's perspective. Now this is heresy. The earth doesn't have a perspective. We have this token day this week called Earth Day. It's us society that thinks that we're smart and we're busy destroying it to make a lot of money. The reality is we're beyond stupid to do that. But let's look at some climate catastrophes. I look at them now from the perspective of the earth. And I, when I look at what happened last August and September, Tropical Storm Henry flooded Henri, flooded New York City, set new records in Central Park. Ten days later, it came along the remnant of Hurricane Irene, broke the records again flooding the subways, the roads, the basement. From the Earth's perspective, we will have to flood those banks and financial institutions till they grasp it's, it's, they should not be funding the fossil empire. Question for us is how long that's, is that going to take? Texas infrastructure is a beautiful example. There's been hurricanes and hurricanes trying to destroy the offshore wells. But March last year, there was record-breaking Arctic blast that started in the stratosphere over the North Pole, propagated downwards, propagated in three bursts down to Texas and froze the power grid and destroyed the refineries. Massive damage to the refineries, which were not very vulnerable to hurricanes. 
very fitting. And they'll have to be destroyed because they're a key part of what the US is doing. All we read in the press is statements like, the refineries in the US are not at capacity. There was staggering heat extreme in June in Northwest US and British Columbia. A famous historian, Christopher Burt said, this was the most anomalous extreme heat event to occur anyone on, anywhere on earth since temperature records began. Typical temperatures were 10 degrees above any historic maximum. It broke the Canadian record by eight Fahrenheit, massive fires forest followed. And then in November, there was a Pacific atmospheric river, which British Columbia doesn't normally get, month of rain in two days on the Burton region, and the landslides closed the Trans-Canada Highway and Railway. Now, I was puzzled until I looked up what British Columbia is doing. They've put in new mines for natural gas. They're liquefying it for export. No, 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 no. But the extremes are getting even more staggering. I don't know how many of you noticed this. It's not gardening in Vermont. Last month, there was a new Antarctic record over the Antarctic Plateau, which was 70 degrees Fahrenheit over the 30-year climatology, 70 degrees. The desert hot air over Australia was just shipped down by the earth down over Eastern Antarctica, these hot temperature extremes here. Well, why does that matter? Never happened before. The scientists simply said, if you told me three days ago this was going to happen, I would never, never have believed you. It's never happened before. But what is at stake now, and we've already realized this, is that if we can melt the West Antarctica and the East Antarctica, we could push sea level up by 20 or 30 feet globally. Just before this happened, the Jargon was it won't happen for hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years. And the same week, temperatures near the North Pole for some stations reached 30 centigrade. That's I think 50 something above normal. This is a very difficult perspective for us to deal with because it's not the way we are all trained. The earth seems to be generating extremes now. We can see them forecasting though is a real challenge on the gardening time scales. My advice to you is watch your garden, watch the weather and the living earth and prepare and realize that the earth is aware of your choices, even though you're not aware of that. And as far as you can, grasp the concept that you need to surrender to the earth's frame. And if you can do that, the earth will start to communicate with you. And even if you don't, it doesn't, it will still communicate to you in ways you can barely grasp, what we call serendipity, for example. There are all sorts of global crises and global emergencies that, that I will just skip over. And there's the global protests by the youth and indigenous who have absolute the right to stop business as usual from destroying the earth and to stop the rich and powerful from killing our own children. So last review, and I'm almost done, the climate crisis needs a new perspective, what I will simplify as the indigenous perspective on the earth. We can analyze and model the climate after the fact, but now our challenge is the earth seems to be selecting extreme modes that damage our fossil and industrial infrastructure. But if you must need to realize that you can actually step into the indigenous perspective and connect to what the earth is doing on a daily basis. And you will get all sorts of inspired choices as gardeners through intuition, serendipity, which will deepen your web of connections to each other. And my basic suggestion is this talk is heresy. Discuss it though among yourselves and listen to the widespread of reactions and ask those who feel deeply connected to the earth and encourage them to seek guidance because the difficulty here is that you actually have to surrender to the living earth. And we've all been trained in our society, fight, fight and never surrender because of you know, a thousand years of militarism. And you will glimpse different aspects of the truth that will set you free to understand what is really going on. And I, I wrote this longer review on this. So I think I've, oh, anyway, that's my end of my talk. Thank you, Alan. Right on time. Oh, but uh, I'll have to oh. get my slide. This is nothing. 
get off. This is just other slides. I have to get my slides out of here. I, I have to disconnect probably, do I? Don't disconnect. Can you disconnect my pictures? <sighs> I think you just go down and say stop, stop share. <laughs> I'm looking for it. I'll actually close this slide. I think I can do that. Oh, close. I'm still maybe I can. Uh, I'll, I'll find it. Meeting controls. Stop share. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're doing beautifully. Uh, I think we're open for some questions. Michelle, do we have some? We have some, yes. Um, we have some comments. We have some questions. Um, a couple of folks were intrigued by um, being able to grow rice in Vermont. Um, so we have a little bit of discussion going on about that. Um, and then let me scroll down here a little bit. Um, Fred, I may just ask you to um, ask your questions in person because there is a couple of them and I'm trying to kind of prioritize here. I just didn't want you to end early. So I tried to give you enough. <laughs> enough to ask about that we could keep going until 7 30. <laughs> oh, Ellen, oh I, I don't think I, that's a problem. I think consciously or unconsciously most gardeners are with you. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any argument about the wisdom of the soil and what we're learning from the earth. I think we're potentially a mobilizable um, cohort mm -hmm. uh, that can join in. I, I got an email to you I sent through chat just now but um, I'm reading Powers' uh, Overstory, which is a basically a novelist, but a plea to save the forests. And of course, the, 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 the forests are taken in their entirety, not, not being split up. So he, he describes in fiction, people camping out at the top of redwoods. I think what we need to do with the gardening community is help them mobilize. And if, if we're a little too tame and too preoccupied with growing our kale, um, maybe we could become scientists. I, I just think there's, I'd love to see your notebooks. Why don't you tell us what's in your notebooks? And Leslie Ann, I'd love to hear what you're doing with the students to introduce a scientific perspective around all this environmental rhetoric. It's, we're not getting anywhere. We, at any rate, that, I'll shut up, sorry. <laughs> don't apologize. I, yes, I've got 20, 30 years in my notebook. But it's basically what I planted, when I planted it, and when I harvested it. It's not very complicated. And yes, I still grow kale. And I've planted my kale, heresy of heresies. It's already there. And it's actually, some of it is covered with a little warm cover because I don't want to wait till Memorial Day, even though that is the tradition. The issue that I'm raising, though, is what our society doesn't understand is this is a two-way process. You have to watch the gardens and understand what's happening in the gardening world. That's absolutely true. But you don't under, we are not taught that you can talk to the earth itself, the living creation, because our religions made very sure that we don't understand. When I listen to what people give sermons on Easter, there's always, there's one way, and I always say, ah, but it's a two-way process. And there's a two-way process here that you can step into as well while you're gardening, and that will help. I'd like to throw a question that's here. It's from Ishmael. It's the question is, as the collection of data is a significant part of science, though not only in that role, there is definitely a place for gardeners to participate in research. I think the question is the role of gardeners to be doing research that we can collect data, beneficial data that we can share amongst one another to be better informed and more aware of what's going on with changing conditions. And so I, I'll just... I would throw that to both of you. <laughs> and I'll add just before you um, respond, there's a follow up to that is, and, and I understand this too, part of it is figuring out what to measure, how to measure it, and how those measurements are stored. Another part is making the process of data collection as easy and straightforward as possible. Isn't somebody doing this, Leslie Ann? Yeah. 
those archives being collected? I, I, I was I was trying to capture the question so I could answer it fully. But yeah, there are a number of um, what you describe is what's called citizen science. And there are a number of frameworks that are already set up to have the, the templates for what to collect, when to collect it, where to report it. So it's all coming in consistently. So it could be used consistently to do research and to also sort of see patterns and changes across wherever it is it happens to be. The one that comes to mind is um, lilacs already doing that for, for those and so you can see the, the the sort of earlier dates that lilacs are blooming another one is um they're the things that are all observed on labor day and it's a it's a big national push that everybody goes out again the methodology is all the same so that we're all collecting it on the same day of the year so that that also brings some consist consistency so citizen science and many many ways of, of seeing it even down to the actual instruments that you use sometimes um, I think Birdas have been doing this for a while as well. Um, so, so there are a number of things to sort of tap into exactly what you're asking about Ishmael. Great. And if I can find this really quickly while we chit chat, I'll, I'll try and pop some of these into the chat. One thing that has come up in a previous conversation is also the ability, and maybe one of you knows this, this that's already going on, for us to maybe um, as individual gardeners um, perform some sort of experiments on our on what we're doing and how we're how we're dealing how we're trying to implement new strategies. So um, you know, try some new strategy in our garden with maybe having a control plant that we're not you know trying to protect, um, and then finding a way to share that information or record it so that others can um, contribute to those experiments, for lack of a better word, um, or at least benefit from some of the strategies that, that others have tried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That may be a new thing that we that we try to put together, but I, I didn't know if either of you knew um, of anything like that that was already um, organized. Well, I know these things exist, but I'm too busy to really myself get involved with them. I just watch my own garden, I record it, and I maintain my crops, and I try to garden through the winter um, under, under a single sheet of glass, and I just let the snow lie on top of that. And that's been very successful for the last 20 plus years, maybe longer than that. Um, but you as a group, there's enough of you in basically one location here that you could organize and ask this question among yourselves and record stuff. What would you like to know? What would you like to grow? What are you challenged by? And we I have a good place these. to start because we have um, received bunches of questions um, in advance about very specific things. Leslie Ann um, addressed one of them with the wind um, wind damage to plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just popped into the chat the um, the National Phenology Network, which is the one that I can think of right off the bat, and the one on Labor Day, I'll have to do some digging. I think it, it also involves some pictures because pictures are a thousand words. And that's one way that we know how things are also changing by looking at things like bud breaks and keeping both a, a written record like Alan does, but also a, a photo record of when the bud breaks actually occurred and, and the, the day of the year, the Julian day and so on. Fred, you were waving. Yeah, I just think there's some universals that all gardeners could start to collect some information on it. It, it ain't too complicated. It's, it's experience uh, planting your rows on the axis, the north-south axis versus the east-west axis. It's uh, intentional shade. It's ways of protecting your plants uh, during the early season and late season from frost. It's learning more about the microecology of your own 25 to 30 foot plot, but most critically, it could be composting. Every goddamn garden should have a should have a compost on one corner, and we're we're not even able to do that on the 16 gardens in Burlington. We got 16 community gardens, and there's been no real concerted effort to get everybody having compost piles. How much how much carbon could we sequester 
if we had all the gardeners in New England composting at the edge of their pl I mean, it ain't rocket science. What do we need to get these people under the same flag? I have six I compost know. bins in a row. Uh, Say it again. I have six compost bins in a row. Some stuff <laughs> takes a couple of years to completely compost. And, and I grow cover crops all the time. I mean, there are- I know it. We've got a hundred yards of raspberries under hugel culture, which is the ultimate in composting. There's whole logs and old two by fours and stuff we've scavenged from the lake, the side of the lake, pieces of people's ice houses. It's all slowly rotting into the ground underneath. I mean, how simple is that? <laughs> but we kind of have some, some notes and some feeling of collectivity and some feeling that we're not just I, you know, oddball gardeners. Well, you, you're the garden society. Do it. <laughs> you're right. Keep challenging us. I'll shut up. Sorry. No, it's good, Fred. Go for it. Uh, there is a question. Uh, is our best defense to overprepare, to expect extremes, to garden defensively? So far, Vermont has been spared events like wildfires and tomato and tornadoes. Perhaps this will continue for years to come, but who knows? So before Alan jumps in, I'm going to put out my favorite word, which is systems. I mean, it's the word that I always slide in. Whatever I do, whatever talk I give, every class I teach, it has to be from a systems perspective because I, if, if you are only focusing on one thing, so let's say you're only focusing on, on droughts or floods or frost or, you know, heat stress on your plant, then you're going to get blindsided by something you weren't thinking about or preparing for. So I would say all of the above in terms of trying to be prepared, but at least having that awareness of there could be something else that you hadn't thought about or that you hadn't prepared for. And flexibility is the name of the game. Mm. And it, things differ. If you have water, you don't have to worry about drought. You just have to pay attention to what the water levels in your soil are. But if you have a large field, as opposed to uh, you know, 100 by 200 foot patch, irrigation from a sprinkler starts to get difficult. Or you have to put your fields where there's some streams and you can divert them in, in a crisis like that. But I mean, you, everyone's garden is unique and everyone has to pay attention to what they've got. And general questions about the uncertainties ahead cannot be answered. You, but you can certainly have tools in your, in your toolbox, toolbox for all the situations that you as gardeners are familiar with. And you collectively as gardeners could be very wise in exchanging that information with everybody in your group. Fred, why don't you, you've got a lot of questions, Fred. Why don't you throw one out? Who? Fred. <laughs> I'm not He's... muted. I muted myself. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes. There must be some research being done on how much carbon can be sequestered in a 10 by 12 foot compost pile. No, anywhere? Something to make people I'll, I'll throw that back to you, Fred. Have you reached out to Extension and, and seen if there's any work like that going on? Wesley Ann, I'm too much of an insider to even go there. My impression is Extension is in chaos and struggling to keep alive. I've just visited the offices of the Extension Service in my county here in Florida. The, enti the entire staff of our county Extension Service is larger than the whole Extension Service of Vermont. I think they're struggling for their existence. Uh, bless, bless them. They're, they're all doing the Lord's work, whoever the Lord is. But um, I, uh, I wouldn't go to Extension. I think we've okay. got to do it ourselves. I think we've got to network among the gardeners. We've got enough expertise. I've carried this image of Alan gardening in the snow from a slideshow he gave at UVM about 15 years ago. We, we can communicate more with one another with some good photographs. You, you both had it in your lectures. You had great stuff in, that, in those photographs. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know what I'm what I'm talking about. I'm I'm just frustrated. I, you know, we're counting ourselves on our relationships between gardeners. All that's been brought about by COVID. I don't care about the relationships against gardeners. I want good gardeners to be out there. I want gardeners to be good scientists to to know why their raspberries are drying up at the end of the year that they need water like everything else. And at any rate, Alan, I'll join you in composting. For the last two years, from May through October, I've composted all the yard waste from 16 households in my condo area down by Oak Ledge, um, carrying it the five miles mostly by car down to my garden. I've got the best compost pile in the area. But I'm not, I feel like I'm alone, like alone. You know, everybody's talking about carbon ext It's got to be garden by garden that we sequester carbon. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. Well, but you know, where does the stuff go in most societies, in our societies? It gets thrown away in the trash. Instead of being composted to feed the soil. It's exactly. a big education job. It's not you. I'm glad you're doing it for a regional area, but most people do not compost all their organic waste. It's so simple. It is exactly. You just need a bin. Right. A bin. Well, you have to put up with the fact that there are a few critters that will tear at your bin and drill into it with their teeth and things like that. But still. I've only got one or two out of six or eight I've, bins where that's been visible. I've got a post hole digger and I put my chicken scraps 16 inches under the ground and there's, they've never been touched by moles, skunks, possums, all animals that have drowned in the 35 gallon garbage can I keep at the corner of my garden to water my garden. So. Well, you just have to go around all those people you're collecting the stuff from and, and look at them with a stunned expression and say, why aren't you compass, compacting all your yard waste? I give them squash and zucchini and tomatoes for their compost. And so they're happy to have you do it. Of course. Of course. But you, the things need to be spread through the society. Exactly. And I think that gardeners could be the point of a spear on this. They will go and do it. The forest people have. Good. I'd like to ask Leslie Ann and, and Alan, it seems like a lot of our conversation here is coming back to us, the Vermont Gardening Network, to maybe facilitate research from our garden perspective and <laughs> find ways we can share and inform each other and, and be that kind of a, a facilitator of, of this awareness about the climate and its impact on our life. I'd like to ask each of you any advice to us, how we can and thoughts you have on what we could be doing to, uh, to get more people from the garden to kind of climate friendly gardening. So I just put a, a, a comment in the chat and it, it, it's about all of the great materials that always get put in, in the chat um, sessions whenever we do things like this in, in Zoom. And that's one of the really cool things about um, being in this virtual space that it allows folks who um, have a lot of resources to share but may not necessarily turn their camera on to share them. It allows for collecting them all in one place. And so I had just asked if, if they were recorded not or, or saved somewhere and, and Michelle just responded. Yeah, I think it would be great if there was like a, a Google Doc or something else like that that people thought about stuff after the fact or somebody who wasn't at that particular session, if you could continue to like curate all of these resources so that then they could be shared out, that's one piece. The other piece I think is um, not reinventing the wheel and not thinking that you have to go it alone because a lot of times from my perspective where I sit, I, I know that this person is doing the same thing as that person, but they don't know each other. And so I like to serve as that connection piece between all of the various things that are going on in the same place because everybody has limited resources. And to the extent that you don't reinvent the wheel and somebody two towns over or two gardens over is doing something similar, partnering would help to, to make for a bigger whole. And so to the extent that there may be other folks 
um, who are doing similar work as the Vermont Garden Network that you could be partnering with, that could be um, a great way to sort of amplify a lot of, and then you might also discover that, hey, there's a lot of similarity in, in other folks that, you know, maybe in a different part of the state or on the other side of the lake. Great. Alan, you want to take a shot at that? I have no memory anymore. I don't know what the real question is here. <laughs> it, it was asking you for advice, thoughts, suggestions on our role as the Vermont Garden Network to better facilitate, coordinate, gather information, ways we can have gardeners doing research and we can collect regionally, kind of thinking about what's a, uh, a better role for us to help facilitate conversations on climate gardening. I don't have a succinct answer to that. It's a very complex issue. And I don't think it's about really a, for your gardeners doing research. It is figuring out how to share your experience as gardeners, as the climate changes, with all the things which give your garden stability in the face of the unknowns. Hmm. Okay. And all your gardeners should be thinking about the climate system. They have to think about the climate system every year when they plant their gardens and look after them through the year. So what, and the climate system is different every year and it's different with every extreme weather event that we see. So you're looking in a sense for generalizations that I don't think exist. I think you have to spread the information you have, give it so that people have some tools, more tools to be able to garden through the variety of extremes and understand what's happening in their garden and how that links to the climate system that they've had for this year. Good. So I think- age- we're not going to be able to tell, no one's going to be able to tell you three months ahead of time what the weather is going to be exactly like when you have to harvest those crops. You have to be ready to deal with that situation, whatever it is, with some levels of protection. Early frosts are easy. I have sheets that I cover with and, and sticks of wood. It's very uncomplicated. Or a little, a few rocks. Winter itself, I just do a limited amount under glass. The spring, if I can get my cover crop in a lot earlier and dug over a lot earlier in the winter, I simply dig it over. If I can dig it over in February, I will do it because I can usually expect then that I will be able to plant sooner in the spring. And I need a little bit of protection. I've got those waiting in my garage. So it's educating your gardeners to think in a broader picture, talk to each other more, spread what you do know. And if you don't know, ask others. If it's a climate related question within what the frame of what uh, Leslie Ann was talking, pitch it to Leslie Ann. If it, you think I can answer it, you can pitch it to me. Great, thank you. One thing I was gonna say, there's a lot of um, really cool stuff going on in the chat right now. and. Um, I think one piece is just how much sharing of information I think occurred just this evening here. And I think that's reflected in a lot of the, um, the comments that are in the chat right now. And that, that always sort of brings me back to the point of never sell, sell yourself short. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, an absolute wealth of information anytime folks who are doing similar things get together in one space. And if there's a way of amplifying and elevating what you already know, and then you can actually figure out what are the gaps and, and how to go about filling the gaps. So I think um, there's probably a lot of stuff, a lot of power in 
in the network right now. And it's just a case of harnessing what that might look like so that you can then take it to the next level. So I don't think anything has to start from scratch. I think there's there's a lot of stuff that just got shared just in this chat here. And so mm -hmm. the ability to bring all three of the sessions together in one place is always a starting point because then you will really see how much you already know. And then you'll really be able to sort of target what, what, what Fred's advocating for and how do you take it to the next level, right? So then you can combine the science with the passion with the everything else because you know what you're starting from. Right. So um, I just wanted to reiterate what Leslie Ann is talking about. I'd like to read one of the one of the things in the chat. Um, and it sort of sums up what you both have said pretty nicely, I think. Um, I'm only learning this year about the relationships between how we garden and carbon sequestering. I didn't even know there was anything that I could do. Didn't know what carbon sequestr sequestration even was. We all have learning to do. Now that I know better, I can do better. Thank you. And, um, you know, this conversation started with, you know, what do we need to know and what can we do? It's ending with how do we continue this conversation? How do we stay involved? How do we, um, you know, we had 65 people signed up for this session tonight and only what 14 people or 15 people are here. So I know there's a, a, a lot of interest in this. I actually have an intern coming to work with us in June and July and was struggling for a project um, for him, but I think I found it. So, um, so stay tuned. We will definitely uh, make sure that all of this information is collected and figure out a way to share it so that it makes sense for people and, um, and continue to have these conversations. Awesome. Thanks again for having us. Can't speak for Alan, but thanks again for having us. <laughs> We really appreciate both of your time. You know, you have a, you have um, important work that you're doing. So to, to give us an hour and a half of your time is is, um, is special to us. Thank you both. Thank you both very much. Anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. And so nice to see so many familiar faces. Mm -hmm. All right, we will let everyone know when these um, recordings are edited to cut out the you know housekeeping stuff in the beginning. And um, I'll make sure that the chat is, uh, questions and comments are, uh, are organized in a way that they can benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, happy planting. Great, thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs>